And if they truly search their souls, they should be up front with us and from, up front with the police, reveal everything that they're holding back about that because it might help um, the police deduce where Sebastian is. For example, let's say they got in a big argument and Sebastian said, I'm going to dad's house. And she said, fine, go. Right? Okay, go, leave. But don't take your shoes. If you're going to go to dad's, you're not taking the shoes that I bought you. So go barefoot. And he goes out. And then she thinks to herself, oh man, a few hours later, where is he? Chris, I sent him outside the house without shoes. He hasn't shown up. I just went outside and I think he actually ran away. And then that would be the part that they hide. So there's a lot of nuance to these things. What do Katie and Chris Proudfoot, the mother and stepfather of missing autistic teen Sebastian Rogers, know about his disappearance, if anything? I'm Deception Detective. I'm an attorney trained in statement analysis. And this channel exists to expose lies and manipulation. Today we'll watch the Proudfoot's very first interview, which they gave about a week after Sebastian was reported missing and we'll be looking for signs of guilty knowledge. This video is part of my ongoing Sebastian Rogers series, and if you've been following, following along, you'll know I've avoided analyzing the Proudfoots for over a month now, and that's for three reasons. The first is I was hoping to interview the Proudfoots. I made multiple offers to them, but I've not heard back, so we're going to analyze them here today. The second reason is I think other analysts like Pat Brown and Peter Hyatt have already done a great job analyzing the Proudfoots. And the third reason is something that's unique to me, which I've talked about in the DD forum, and we'll go over that in this video. Without further ado, let's listen. Can't even imagine as a parent what you two are going through. How would you describe the situation right now? How are you coping? <laughs> um, We're on a constant roller coaster ride of helpless and hopeless and many other emotions all in one and it's a never ending roller coaster. It doesn't stop. It won't stop until he walks through the door. I wouldn't wish this on anyone. Not anyone. I know we're about keeping hope alive. I'm sure that's in there somewhere. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's going to come home. One thing I don't like with interviewers is when they provide answers to the interviewee. So what we're watching now is the unedited cut of the first interview the Proudfoots did with a local news station, I think, WSMV4. And it's recorded in four parts. So even though this one's just five minutes, there's like three other parts that we'll look at. The issue with an interviewer providing the answer to the question is that we don't hear what the parents are saying or what they would have said without that feedback. And it's important for us to hear that because there are seven things we look for when parents of missing children get the opportunity to go onto the news or speak to a YouTuber or do an interview. And I'll just go over those here so you can bear them in mind as we listen. This is my list. You can find it in the DD forum. I've used it across multiple cases on the channel from the McCanns to the Wells uh, to William Tyrrell's foster parents to Jen Soto. And I have not updated it in a very long time because it's so predictive. So here's what we look for. We want the parents to speak about the kid in the present tense. We want the parents to be cooperative. So if they get asked a question, they do their best to answer the question and not over answer, right? So they answer what they're asked, but they're not trying to push a narrative. Like the McCann's pushing the narrative of a kidnapping when they're asked what could have happened. Third is the parents are inconclusive. So if the parents say 100%, my kid was kidnapped without any evidence that someone broke into the house, or in this case, they say, my kid walked away or ran away without any evidence that uh, the kid did that, it's a red flag. Fourth, if the kid is missing and the parents are on TV, we can expect them to address 
a kidnapper. So even if they're not sure the kid was kidnapped, they don't know what actually happened. So we can expect them to at least look into the camera and say, if you have my son, Sebastian, please return him to us. We won't per- pursue you. Just drop him off at a police station. Fifth, we can expect parents to address the child through the camera. Since they don't know what happened to their kid, they can, they, for all they know, the kid is watching. So they'll take that opportunity to speak to the kid. Sebastian, we know you're out there. If you're watching this, we love you. We're going to find you. Sixth, the parents ask for help. That's the entire point of these appearances. If the parents don't ask for help, it means A, that they might know the kid is beyond any help. They might know the kid is already dead. Or it might mean they have an ulterior motive. They're not necessarily doing this interview to help find their kid. They're doing it to push a narrative or they're doing it to clear their own name. Either way, they have some other agenda and that's not expected if your kid is missing. And seventh, there's a call to action. So if the parents have to be prompted to say, you know, if you see my kid, call 911, or if they have to be prompted to describe their kid um, or ask for help, it means that once again, their appearance was not about finding the kid. There was some ulterior motive, and we need to figure out what that was. All right, let's keep listening. He's going to walk through that door. <laughs> and this street will be flooded again with family and relatives all waiting to hug and love him. And so That boy's going to have more friends than he knows what to do with when he comes home. <laughs> So. so here we are eight days now searching for him walk us through that Sunday night that he went missing so walk us through we've got so many people who really want to know okay how did this happen so kind of just walk us through that night um, we were out and about that day we were having a really good weekend um, we got home Uh, Everything was pretty normal. He was playing in his room. Um, When I told him to go to bed, he did. (laughs) Um, He said, good night, Mom. I love you. Um, Say good night to his puppies. A little bit later, I wound up going to bed. And um, when I woke him up for school, he wasn't there. When I woke him up for school, he wasn't there. That's an interesting statement, and lots of people have commented that on my previous videos, saying that the mom said that. And it is a strange statement, because if someone's not there, you can't wake them up for school. If she said, I went into his room to wake him up for school and discovered he wasn't there, that would make more sense. So why did she say that? It could be that this story is fabricated. right? So your imagination is a lot weaker than your memories. So if you scripted the sto- a story of what you did that morning, let's say she and Chris sat down and said, okay, here's what you're going to say. You're going to say you went into his room to wake him up for school. He wasn't there. You panicked. That could explain a small mess up like that, where she says something that doesn't technically make sense. Kind of like how the McCann said, well, we went into Madeline's room and found, found her not there. It doesn't make sense. You don't find something that's not there. You might realize she wasn't there, or you might find an empty bed, but you don't find someone who's not there. And um, there's a whole uh, analysis behind that if you want to watch my McCann's playlist. But suffice to say, that is a strange statement. I recognize it as such, but we need multiple signs of scripting before we feel more comfortable uh, accusing people of having scripted a story. So let's keep listening, and then we'll get into that third reason why I've put off analyzing these parents for so long. So in your mind, that's usually around what time? When do you normally wake up? Around 6 o'clock? So were you instantly thinking something's wrong, or were you like, he may just be already in the shower? I took a second. I took a second and walked through the house looking for him in case he'd gotten up and was trying to get breakfast or something because he did that sometimes. Um, about three minutes in, give or take, I was on the phone with my husband. And I said, I can't find him. Um, 
Here's another thing that we're going to notice a lot as they talk and as we go through all of their interviews. And this is because of you guys, right? So um, if you're part of the DD forum, I, I read all your posts. If you're a member of the channel, I read all your comments. If you're a subscriber, I read all your comments. And lots of people have pointed out to me the number three. Lots of uh, the times or locations or amounts that the Proudfoots talk about involve the number three. And that is an important detail. And three is actually known as the liar's number. So I'm going to read you that card from the Deception Deck. If you're not familiar, the Deception Deck is my 52 favorite rules for spotting lies and deception. And you can buy it at deceptiondeck.com. So I'm going to read you the card for the number three, which is in the deck. Here's the card. Each card in the deck is a flash card. So it has the rule on the front and on the back it has the explanation of the rule as well as a real world example. So this is the card for three. And I'll just read you the rule. Liars often use the number three in their statements. If a statement includes a three, like 3 p.m., third floor, $300,000, three minutes, it might be fabricated. The reason why people use the number three is unknown. There's lots of different studies into why that happens. But for us, for our purposes, it is a human phenomenon. When people are lying or making up a story, if they need to pick a number out of thin air, they typically pick the number three. Kind of like if people are asked their, their lucky number, they usually pick the number seven. So it, the, the fact that she said she was on the phone with Chris for three minutes or within three minutes, does that mean she's lying? Not necessarily, but we need to be on alert for it. So I'm going to rewind here. Let's listen again. Um, about three minutes in, give or take, I was on the phone with my husband. I said, I can't find him. All right, so three minutes in, give or take, I called my husband. Does that mean she's lying? Not necessarily. It could just be she's guessing about how long it took, right? So they don't. people don't actually have to be trying to deceive you to pick the number three. But it does tell us that she's being a little bit loose with the facts. She's not doing her best to be specific unless it literally was three minutes. And the way she said it, it sounded like it was a guesstimate. So this could either be fabricated, like she took longer to call Chris, or her call with Chris was scheduled ahead of time. You know, something happened to Sebastian the night before, and she and Chris spoke, and he said, okay, at this time, you're going to call me. Um, so she's saying, yeah, it took about three minutes to look for Sebastian because she wasn't actually looking for Sebastian. That's possible. Um. He said, what do you mean you can't find him? I said, he's not in the house. And so at that point, is that when you call 911 or what's going through your mind? She, while we were on the phone and I was, I was like, is he on the other side of the bed? We, the normal places he may be in the house, you know, and he wasn't. So I was like, okay, well, hold on a minute. And immediately after that, we called the sheriff's department and made the report. I and ran all over the house, outside, inside. I looked in every closet. Within minutes, they were here. They responded within minutes, and here we go. So you said you were on the phone with her, so yes, you were not home? No, ma'am. Okay. I was, I was at work. I'm a tower crane operator, and I was working in Memphis at the St. Jude Project. So it's, you know... I have an earpiece in that talks to my phone. I have another earpiece in that does the radios. So when she was talking to me, I was like, what? I was confused. We talked about where he could possibly be. And then we went from there and led to calling the cops. And here we are now. And within minutes, there you're at the home. Yes, ma'am. It was rapid fire. They had cars. <sighs> they they had cars from here down to the... To the main road. road, as far as I could tell. So, what's going through both of your minds? I mean, are we panicking? Is it this, oh, I think he's probably at a neighbor's house, or what are you thinking? My son doesn't run. He's not a runner. He's never run away. 
This is another interesting statement that I've seen brought up a lot. My son doesn't run. He's not a runner. It's a very specific denial. So first of all, okay, fine. He's not a runner, but could he have walked out the door? Could he have been pushed out the door? I know that uh, Peter Hyatt has a theory that they locked him outside as a form of punishment. And then he might have wandered off or something happened to him. That wouldn't require him to run. He could literally just be pushed out the door or walk out the door. Uh, so saying he's not a runner could be 100% true, but it doesn't mean that he wasn't put out and walked off or wandered off due to their negligence or to escape abuse. You don't have to run away to get away from an abusive parent. You can walk away. So that is an interesting thing that she brings up. And also, I've seen clips of them saying he walked out that door conclusively. Well, maybe that's true. Maybe he did walk out the door. But maybe he walked out because he was told to or because there was a threat of punishment if he didn't step outside the door. So that could all be 100% true. The other main thing here is when they talk about him walking out the door, it's very conclusive. How do they know he wasn't kidnapped? How do they know he didn't, um, someone didn't knock on his window and have him come out and then close the window behind him and, and trick him like a predator, tricking him out of the house, kidnapping him, taking him? How do they know he went out the door and not the window, right? So there is some conclusiveness here that is concerning. Now, obviously, we're only four minutes into an interview, but I'm pointing all these things out because these should add up over time. If we see them fail, all seven of these things on our, on our checklist, we can place more chips on our bet that they know what happened to them. Way before, um, I don't know why. I don't know why he walked out that door. Once again, I don't know why he walked out the door. But how does she know if he walked out? The question should be, I don't know what happened to him. She doesn't know why he walked out the door, she, but she does know if he walked out the door. And this is where Peter Hyatt and Pat Brown's analysis makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and I recommend subscribing to their channels. I've recommended both of them to my in my member section for a very long time because I think they do great work. I personally have put off analyzing these parents myself, however, because of the way that I approach true crime and the sort of Bayesian thinking that I do. So let's wrap up this first segment and then I'll go over that um, and how I think about these things and also how you can use Bayesian thinking as a tool to make better decisions when you're analyzing suspects, but also just better decisions in general in your own life. I mean, he's a good kid. He's not... He's not a mischievous child by any means, um, but there's answers to questions that have no answers, you know, or questions, excuse me, questions with no answers right now that we are searching for desperately, and we just don't have that. You think back, and th there might have been a reason he was possibly upset or something outside that could have enticed him to go outside, was there anything that came to mind? We've been combing over that day and even the weeks before he left and I don't, I haven't been able to figure it out. He's, um, that morning he was laughing, he was joking. Everyone we were around that day agreed that he seemed like he was in a good mood, he was behaving. Notice how the constant question they have is why he walked out. That's what they're saying they don't know. They're not saying they don't know whether or not he walked out. So I think it's safe to assume they know for a fact that he walked out that front door. And the question is, of course, did he walk out because he wanted to be a teen runaway or because he was being abused or because he was pushed outside as a form of punishment? I think that's what this all boils down to at this point, because they seem certain that he walked out the door. Now, could they be hoaxing? Could they be saying that, that he went out that door because they did something else to him and they want us to believe he walked out the door? Yes. 
But the fact that they're slipping up by saying that they know he went out, they just don't know why, seems to indicate that they're trying to hide the fact that they know for sure he went out the door. Behaven. Make more sense if we'd been fighting. Or you'd been in trouble, but he wouldn't have been in trouble. <laughs> so, I mean, a, the million dollar question, why did he go? And the other million dollar question is how? What about social media? Is there anything that, you know, anyone he could have contacted? I understand he was somewhat of a gamer or what was he? There was a video game he loved, right? There's Minecraft. A, yeah. He loves Minecraft. Um, the the game that he has is not online. He has the the um, Switch. Um, he's we don't because of how social media can be. He doesn't have accessibility to communicate with folks on the internet. On the internet. I mean, I we have a firm belief that we just don't feel it right now. That he's capable of having that kind of responsibility mm -hmm. so i mean he his phone is locked down his computers his game he doesn't have a gamer tag he doesn't have online capabilities with games um i mean we've he, um we've combed every electronic every electronic i mean we've cooperated with all the authorities as far as anything they've asked us to provide we've provided so far they're speaking about him in the present tense. And they seem to be trying to be cooperative. They are a little bit conclusive about him walking out that door. So they have zero curiosity about whether or not he was kidnapped or, or went out the window or did something else. Which is why I think they know for a fact he went out that door. It's just about figuring out why that happened. They've not addressed any potential kidnappers. They've not addressed him through the camera yet. They've not asked for help and they've not done any sort of call to action yet. And that might just be because they think this portion of the interview is background. But I think the actual interview that was shown on the news was clipped from this. And still just don't have any answers. Did he have any friends that could have possibly contacted him in some way on his phone? All his friends at school have been questioned, to my knowledge, and none of them knew anything. So this big question mark. He's vanished. Yes, ma'am. No one can figure out where or why. Um, all right. So let's talk to you about the relationship involved, because they're, the biological father is very much involved in Sebastian's life as well. Yes, ma'am. Very is. much. Right. Um, and, and how would you describe? If you've not followed along on this series, I have analyzed the biological father, Seth Rogers, in my video, How to Tell Innocent from Guilty. We analyzed him along these exact same criteria, and he came out squeaky clean. Describe that relationship, the two of them, and the four of you. It's relatively good. I mean, we talk regularly. He talks to his son on a regular basis, sees him on a regular basis. He's involved in school and therapy. And um, I mean, he doesn't have any extracurricular activities, but I can tell you now, if he did, he'd, his dad would be in the front row. <laughs> um, I mean, two different households. And the communication between the three of us is, is great. I mean, yes, we're just like every parent. We all have our disagreements, but in the end, we come together as a team and we work and we come up with solutions that as we best see fit. I mean, he's, I'm almost in contact with him almost daily. Um, let's talk about Sebastian. Tell me about Sebastian. How would you describe him? Sweet, stubborn. <laughs> Um, he loves to help. He loves uh, running and he loves to play his games and his fidgets and um, Uno. Lord, that's one of his favorite games right now. Um, favorite color is green. Um, 
Does he love music? Oh, God. Oh. He loves music. An eclectic taste. Probably. An eclectic. I mean, from, as everybody knows, Eye of the Tiger to Eddie Vedder. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So we got we got Pearl Jam on one hand. We've got Survivor on the other over here. We've got Taylor Swift and uh, he's got a big crush on her. <laughs> um, I mean, country rock. No classic. We don't. We don't allow the hip hop. Well, he, he doesn't really well, get I into it anyway. Things. We, you mentioned you love running, so. Did he love the outdoors at all? I mean, would something outside that was somewhat outdoorsy be? So Chris says they they don't allow hip hop. He also said that the phone was locked down, no internet. So they seem like strict parents. Enticing so to him or pull him outdoors. He loves like when. Um, when we were in California and the school had this lap thing to gain money. It was a fundraiser. And every year he was, I did this many laps. I did this many laps. I mean, I've got t-shirts where they would write on his back. Every time the kids went around, they'd mark a mark on the back and they'd keep running. And he just had marks all the way across his back. Also note, this is like the third time the mom has talked about Sebastian running. First, she said he's not a runner, as in he runs away from home. But then earlier when they were talking about what he likes, she said he likes running. And now she's going into this anecdote about him running laps. What is she saying? She might be trying to tell us that he might have gone far. That maybe he did run away. And he might be further than people expect. Um, he likes playgrounds. Um... He hates oh, yeah. being dirty. He, he don't like being, being dirty. dirty. Yeah, he's not a he's not your tomboy style child where he goes outside and plays in the mud. He loves animals, but he's terrified <laughs> of bugs. Oh yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. I mean, yeah. even a fly, and he's like, oh. <laughs> he's highly functioning. I know you all have described him. Is having a form of autism. He does. But des describe that to our viewers, too, as far as his way of thinking of things and maybe how determined he was about certain things or his mindset. He, um... <laughs> he, he's got a stubborn mindset. If he believes it's this... He gets on a one-man track, and he is just yeah. on it, and he is all about it. <laughs> um, but, I mean, he's, he's very smart. He's I smart. Mean, he, he can play chess. He he can beat adults in chess. Wow. So he's okay. He loves he loves 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 playing games. What about navigation? Like, did he have a sense of direction? Do you think he could have possibly even hitched a ride or gotten a ride on a bus or some sort of transportation? That is a speculation that we don't have an answer for. Just directionally, he knows. He could guide you from our house to his dad's house. Yeah. He could get from like this house. I think he can make it up to Culver's ice cream. He can go to Culver's. Oh, boy loves he knows malt. where Culver's <laughs> is because Culver's has malt. Uh -huh. He loves malt. Extra malt. Every yeah. time. Extra malt. Now, how far away does his dad live? Clarksville. His dad lives up by Clarksville. So he could guide someone all the way to Clarksville. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Okay. So a pretty keen sense of direction, at least with certain things. Uh, if, familiar routes. Yes. Familiar routes. Okay. Familiar routes. And if I took him another route going he this takes way, he it. would not know it. Mm. He goes up there so often that he, he knows is. he knows how to get to his daddy's. Right. We know that. His dad works with him as far as, well, we're going this way, we're going that way, and mm -hmm. keeps the same thing. One of the things I like about this is that they're not trying to push a narrative. So if you've seen my Well series, you know they were pushing the kidnapping narrative. No matter what the question was, they tried to bring it back to a kidnapping. Or the McCanns, no matter what the question was, is could this be possible? Is that possible? It would always, they found a way to push it back to a kidnapping narrative. Same with William Turrell. In all of those cases, when I saw how they were pushing the kidnapping story, I was confident in saying that the parents knew what happened and that they were responsible for what happened to the kid. 
because they're pushing the kidnapping narrative. In this case, while they have not addressed any kidnappers or addressed Sebastian in the camera yet, or even asked for help, or even described him yet, they are being cooperative and they're answering all the questions the reporter is asking them. Now, with that said, a lot has come out about the Proudfoots and how they treated Sebastian and in other interviews where they said sort of belittling things about him, um, questioning his manhood. And I think that those details have biased people against the Proudfoots more than what's warranted. And that's the reason I've put off analyzing the Proudfoots with the hopes that Sebastian would turn up before I did this. Um, however, I've offered to interview them. They have not taken me up on it. My members have voted two weeks in a row for me to analyze them. My last video hit 50K. So my audience, you guys are my number one priority. So I'm going to give you the videos that you want and try to teach you the lessons that I think will help you in your everyday life. So why did I put off analyzing the Proudfoots? Um, I'm going to explain that to you in a way that I explained it in the forum by asking you two questions and then I'll break it down. The first question is, so answer this question. Here it is. Amy, a fictional character, is an autistic teenager living with her mother and stepfather, Stan. Amy has been missing for over a month. Stan, who has a history of domestic abuse, did not immediately contact the police after Amy's disappearance. Based on this information, which of these two options is more likely? Option number one, Amy ran away. Or option number two, Amy was killed by Stan. Most of my uh, subscribers and followers on X voted for Amy was killed by Stan. 77% in fact. So now answer this question. Amy, a fictional character, is a teenager. Amy has been missing for over a month. Based on this information, which of the following outcomes do you find more likely? Amy ran away or Amy was murdered? When I left out the details about Stan and Amy's disability, 58% answered Amy ran away, and only 41% answered Amy was murdered. And the correct answer in both situations is Amy ran away. Because the question is, which of these is more likely given the details that we have? So even though it's more likely, for example, for a stepfather... Um, with a disabled child to abuse that child than it is for a biological father uh, to abuse a non-disabled child. It doesn't flip the base rates of teenagers running away versus teenagers getting killed by their parents. So the base rates are there's 1.5 million teenage runaways every year compared to just 500 annual filicides where a parent kills their kid. So the ratio is 3,000 to 1 that the kid ran away rather than was murdered. And what happens is when we get biasing details like the stepfather had a criminal record or the stepfather's really mean or he only does interviews with people he can bully or he just seems like a nasty guy, those little details can bias our analysis and we actually forget to consider the base rates because we're biased by those details. And you can see that people understood the base rates when I left out those details. So if you're betting on a case where there is no body, it is a teenager, no matter how mean the parents are or if they even have a criminal record of abuse or they say nasty things about the kid, more likely than not, the kid ran away. The odds are 3,000 to 1. Let's listen closely and see if there's anything else that we're going to factor into our analysis. But so far, if I'm betting, I'm betting that these are not the best parents. They might have been so strict on Sebastian that he ran away, but I'm not seeing murderers. 
thing and it works out. Mm-hmm. So, um, let's talk to because earlier, Chris, you and I were talking and you were saying that there are a lot of people who are harassing both of you. What of any of that do you want to address? What, what do you want to say to any of these people? Just that you don't know. And I don't wish you to ever know. I would say it like this. Everybody has an opinion. You know, and it's perfectly okay to have that opinion. But you're not in this situation. You don't quite understand. Um, I wish people would step back, take a different wide open view, and not assume what they know. It's just better to stick to the facts If they have questions, all they have to do is ask. And I pray genuinely that no one ever goes through this. Just be kind to people. I mean, that's that's real simple. There are some people who have been talking, because I know this is part of the harassment. Um, Is there anything you want to address about this child custody situation? (laughs) With the previous. So I have a, a current case that is going ongoing in another state. So this is the type of information that can bias even intelligent people. Right? I know I have the smartest subscribers. I know I have the smartest followers on X. When I wrote this question, I included these details because I knew how powerful these details are. I knew they would bias even people who have watched all my videos. Right, so I wrote this article while these polls were still going on. I predicted the results. And I personally also have to work hard not to be biased against people. Um, we've requested that case to be sealed because there are some individuals who have taken it upon themselves to put stuff out there that they don't quite know, which... All they have to do is ask, I'll tell you. Um, but because of that, you know, it has nothing to do with our son. It has nothing to do with the situation. You know, it, I just, people would respect that and then keep an open mind. It's totally different. Is Sebastian is able to watch this and maybe he's watching this as it airs? I wish the journalist hadn't brought this up. So now when they talk to camera, it's because the journalist suggested it. I wished I wished the journalist had done something like, is there anything you want to say? Because we will broadcast this on the news. And then wait for them to turn to camera and speak to Sebastian on their own. Um, so unfortunately, this piece of our checklist addressing the child through the camera is dubious now because they are going to do it, but it's at the direction of the interviewer. And if he is, what do you want to say to Sebastian? What do you want him to hear from you right now? Oh gosh, that we love you so much and we want you to come home and you're not in trouble. I guarantee you he is loved and trust me. The open arms are waiting for him to come home from every parent to every family members to. So notice how Chris doesn't include himself there though, right? The, the open arms, passive, the open arms are waiting for him, not my open arms. So do I think Chris had a great relationship with Sebastian? No. Could the relationship have been so bad and so abusive and so strict that Sebastian ran away? Yes. In fact, could the relationship Uh, have been so bad that it could amount to abuse, it's possible. But these are not looking like parents who killed their kid and are now now trying to push a hoax about him running away. It's looking more like parents who were extremely strict on their kid and either compelled him to run away or suggested he run away and are okay with him running away. Um, Something along those lines. 
And just like the Summer Wells case, we need to narrow it down over time. This is just the first interview of theirs I'm analyzing. With Summer Wells, we came up with a very, very uh, sad conclusion for what I think actually happened based on the interviews. Here, hopefully, we come to a more positive conclusion that Sebastian ran away and has been hiding somewhere and is going to reemerge. To probably everyone in the community, but there's no malice that we just want our boy home. Bad. Bad. But. That mama's heart, I know it's daddy's too, but I feel like there's always that extra special bond. Can you walk us through what you're thinking right now? I just want my baby to be okay. I don't know where he's at. I don't know where he's at. Let's talk about the community because I want you all to know. Even even my church body. I mean, we're all praying. We're all praying for his safe return quickly. What do you all want to say to the community? Thank you. With everything from the bottom of our hearts. We, I would not have imagined how far this has gotten, but there's no way to repay gratitude, the love that we have felt from the community, the prayers. But thank you. But from don't stop working. Yeah, please. My son is somewhere. Good. That's what I expect an innocent parent to say. Or at least a parent who knows that the kid might still actually be out there. All right? Thank you, thank you, but don't stop looking. Seth Rogers did the same thing. Uh, they know the kid's out there. Until the kid is found, it's never enough. So Katie, um, what she said there, to me at least, suggests that she knows Sebastian is still out there somewhere. And their greatest sin at this point and any deception that we're detecting could be that they are hiding the reason Sebastian went out the door. They've already admitted they know he walked out the door. They know he didn't run out the door. Something about that front door, they're admitting they know it happened. She didn't say, I, did, I don't know how he got out of the house. She's only saying, I know he went out the door. I just don't know why. And that might be the part that they are admitting um, and that they're being deceptive about. And if they truly search their souls, they should be up front with us and from, up front with the police, reveal everything that they're holding back about that because it might help um, the police deduce where Sebastian is. For example, let's say they got in a big argument and Sebastian said, I'm going to dad's house. And she said, fine, go. Right? Okay, go, leave. But don't take your shoes. If you're going to go to dad's, you're not taking the shoes that I bought you. So go barefoot. And he goes out. And then she thinks to herself, oh man, a few hours later, where is he? Chris, I sent him outside the house without shoes. He hasn't shown up. I just went outside and I think he actually ran away. And then that would be the part that they hide. So there's a lot of nuance to these things. And we're not going to get all that nuance uh, from just one interview. They go until he's home. All right, let's watch the last part of this now. Let's, let's mention it's kind of the, the search itself, because we know thousands of miles have basically been traced and retraced. We've got hundreds of We've got volunteers, we've got law enforcement from within the state, from without, you know, outside of the state. Um, I mean, do you feel like they're doing as much as they can? I mean, you, you've been, you all have been right there in the front seat seeing everything that's, that's underway. As far as I know, they're doing everything. Anything and everything has been an option. They have brought in assets and resources from various counties, potentially other states. I mean, 
I don't know how much more they could do, but we're grateful for everything they have done. They're amazing, but they still have Another thing they constantly talk about from clips I've seen is other states, right? People from other states are helping. Um, I was in another state working. And that could be a little bit of leakage that they might, at the back of their mind, think Sebastian has run away to another state. Like he's gone very far. I haven't brought my baby back. I will. I will. He's out there somewhere. So it's basically, it's one day at a time, getting through this and bringing him home. What is the reaction to the fact that somehow he, his, his image, he hasn't been captured on any video anywhere? I know that it was very dark that night. I mean, it gets dark around here at night in general, but um, so far we haven't found him on any camera footage to prove where he's at or where he's gone. I know that they're looking and I went asking everybody and anybody that has cameras, trial cams, mm -hmm. stores, um, <clears throat> to check even from before he went missing, just to see if there's anything at all. And I understand there, there was a request for video, any sort of footage of Sebastian from earlier in the day, on Sunday, before he disappeared. That I don't believe we can comment on right now. I don't, that is not something that I believe we're pervy to at this point with law enforcement. That is something I would... I have a definitely direct back to them. But, I mean, they, there's all kinds of requests out there. There's thousands of hours of video that they are combing, and we're just hoping they'll find something. And I know this is so sensitive. What do you say to people who inevitably, inevitably end up pointing their finger back at you? We were talking earlier, and, I mean, are you both in the clear? I can tell you that mom, myself, and the father have worked very fully and cooperatively with all agencies across the board. We have anything that they've wanted, we have provided. Um, so cooperation is there. I mean, What do you want to say to our viewers? Anybody who's watching, we've got a lot of folks in this community and in other counties just throughout the state as well. What do you want to say to them? So once again, they're being led into asking for help, a call to action. They never addressed a potential kidnapper, which to me signals that they probably aren't even considering the notion that he was kidnapped from the home. I think they think he ran away. They know he was outside. help spread the word and keep searching and thank you and um just if you think you see him call him in thank all the viewers everybody that's helped from across the board i mean everybody has been tremendous call his name yeah he'll answer and if he doesn't answer he'll at least he'll look Right, so this, the mother is saying the right stuff for the mother of a kid who is missing. Doesn't mean that she wasn't involved in creating the situation where he ran away or went missing. And if we do detect a lot more deception around what happened that night, for example, she's very reticent about what happened that night in this interview. There actually wasn't a lot of meat there to analyze about the specifics of that evening. For example, she seems to indicate that she knows through leakage that he went, that he ran away at nighttime, that he went out the door and that it was dark. When she was asked about the video footage, she said, said it was dark that night. How, didn't she, how did she know he didn't um, run away at dawn with a little bit of daybreak? So she's clearly visualizing him going out the door in the dark. Probably because she watched him do that. 
Now the question is why? Was he forced to? Was he encouraged to? Even if he's not being verbal at the moment, because he can talk, but sometimes he don't talk. <laughs> um, call his name. Tell him to stay put. He could be on the move, so keep checking your properties. Yes. I, the search is never over until he comes home. That is he's for sure. so smart. But thank you for everything that everybody has done, has volunteered, uh, the continuous efforts. I mean, it, it's, like I said, this is, I've never seen something to this magnitude before. Our community is amazing. We're all praying, hoping, and searching for Sebastian. So that's the end of that interview. If you want me to continue the series and analyze the next interview they did, let's get this video to 50,000 views. On your screen now is my analysis of Stefan Stearns, so you can see a very stark difference, as well as my entire Sebastian Rogers playlist if you want to get caught up. Until next time, stay true.